everybody. My name is Duchess Harris, and I am a faculty member at McAllister College. I teach American studies and political science. My expertise is Black women in politics. I am also a proud former trustee of the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, and they are co-sponsoring this event with Share the Mic Minnesota. And so tonight, I'm going to have a multi-generational conversation with my friend, Amy. So Amy, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Amy. Uh, I'm currently a senior at the University of Minnesota, majoring in political science. Uh, I grew up in Plymouth, Minnesota, um, and uh, am currently working and um, I'm currently interning and um, I'm currently interning for the uh, House of Representatives. I am interested in um, having a career in um, politics and in government. Amy, this is so cool. We have so much in common. And so I don't even know who you interned for in the House of Representatives. I just know you're there. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm currently, so I'm from Plymouth, Minnesota. Um, my parents immigrated there um, from China. And so I grew up there when I, uh, I, I, we moved there when I was six. Um, and so I'm currently interning for um, the congressman that represents that district, um, Congressman Dean Phillips, which is great. It's really cool to be yeah. working for a district that I grew up in and I'm a part of. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's been a really, really great experience. That's awesome. I'm familiar with Dean Phillips. That is fantastic. So I teach political science. Why did you choose political science as a major? Uh, um, I remember very distinctly um, being eight or nine years old and watching then President Obama get elected. And I remember that like November night and I had no idea what was going on, right? I was just like this kid. And I remember my sister was, she's eight years older than me. And she was super excited. And she was like jumping up and down. She was looking at the screen. I saw like all this red, white, and blue confetti. And it was just like such a, a moment and an occasion. And, um, like, regardless of like, you know, like what, um, what President Obama did and, and like what the impacts of those policies were, I think that was a moment that really moved people. And that was something that always stayed with me. It was something, it was a moment that moved people. And it was a moment where people saw themselves represented in government. They saw themselves, you know, they saw hope. And I, I that, that has always made a lasting impact on, uh, on me. And, you know, ever since then, I have just always been really invested in politics. I remember I was like this, like, I was like the seventh grader who like watched the State of the Union. And I'd come to school and I'd be like, whoa, look, look what happened last night. Um, but that, that's really where it started. And, and since then, I have been really committed to, um, to, to representation government. That's something that really impacts me um, as a queer you know, Chinese American woman. There's not really, there's no, there's no one actually in Minnesota politics that I feel like I can really see myself in. And that's something that, you know, I, I, I really want to change and something that I'm really passionate about. Wow. So you don't see yourself in Minnesota politicians. I know that you have aspirations to go to Capitol Hill. Yeah. Um, who are you looking at out there? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, that's a really, really interesting question. So I, I it's been a really great interning for my home congressman because right, that's my community. That's, you know, even though I, I grew up in a predominantly white community and I might not see myself in, I might've been a, a really, really small minority in, in that district. It's, it's, it's nice to, you know, you know, in, in the end I did grow up there. And so that's really great. Um, I, in the future, I'd really love to work for, you know, um, a woman of color, a queer woman of color, um, although they're far and few between. I, I'd really love to work for an Asian American. Um, so Congressman Mark Chicano, the first you know queer person of color in Congress, that's someone who I, I, I've looked up to and I, I think is amazing. Uh, and, and so really see, working for someone who um, shares one of my identities is something that I, I really wanna do. Wow, that is exciting. And so, um... You're drawn to politics. You and I had a conversation previously talking about how politics can be more than electoral politics. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? You know, I, I thought a lot about our conversation from last week, Duchess, a ton. And I've talked to a lot of people about it. And um, for those, those of you watching, we, we had a conversation, uh, um, especially after last week's, you know, the Atlanta shooting. Um, and just, you know, from the culmination of, 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 of my work, I, you know, I was talking to Duchess about how, um, like, I, I, I want to work in the system, but I'm not sure if the system can work for me and for my community. And um, you said that, um, you said that I should, I should look at 
studying and learning about Asian American politics because that might like heal a part of my spirit and my soul. And I think that there's just nothing truer than, than, than that. I think that that's something that was just so insightful and something I really, that's really stuck with me. Um, especially considering I feel like I've, I've entered this landscape thinking that, you know, it can be one or the other, or it can, you know, it could be, it can be, I'm working in politics or I'm, or I'm working in like a queer space or I'm working in Asian American space. But like mm-hmm. the idea that all three of them might not even exist yet or maybe they do um and that's something I can do which just really was has been something I've been thinking about and chewing on especially as you know I graduate in May and I, I'm looking at you know next steps that's something that I'm I'm still trying to um to see where what that can hold I mean what I love about your spirit is that I know that you see the politics of possibility right <laughs> I mean, that is a way of thinking about politics. There's so many ways, mm-hmm. right? And so just because it's not there doesn't mm-hmm. mean that you can't create it, right? Yeah. When I hear your story about being in elementary school and watching Obama, I love those stories so much. This is something you don't know about me. I actually teach a course called mm-hmm. Understanding Obama's Legacy. And all the students are your age because it's undergraduates. And many of them talk about that moment, right? And how inspiring that moment is. And it's inspiring because no one had seen it before. And so that's the dream that I have for you, right? Is not just to look to the queer women of color who are already there, but to set your mind right? And so there's this um, old civil rights saying called setting your mind on freedom, right? To set your mind that you could be the one that you're waiting for. Oh, okay. That is such a great idea. And I love it. And that sounds so scary. It's so terrifying to be, to, to be that blueprint and to really see myself as that and that's something that I'm still trying to work on with myself is you know having the courage to really like dream that big because that's it that that is it though and so another old saying I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to take credit for these like (laughs) these these things predate me right but another saying of course is um if not now when Mm -hmm. if not you who Mm mm-hmm Right. And of course, you know, all that saying is, it's like the time is now you're the one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's no reason to think that you can't be. Yeah. Yeah. I, (laughs) I, I think that, um, like I've heard those things before and I think it's such a simple concept. And I think Mm -hmm. that, I think a really defining part of my growing up and, 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 and me coming to terms with my identity is that, um for so long and I didn't see anyone like me right like a queer Chinese American woman wasn't any anything I ever saw growing up it was never something that I it's never something I thought I could even be and you know me coming in terms of my 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 queer identity and my gayness was something that oh that took years and that took tears and it took a lot of heartbreak and it took a lot of um coming to terms and I I really do feel like right now I especially after you know you know really processing what happened last week um and seeing how Asian women are now like thrust into the spotlight and Asian American community is thrust right. in the spotlight. And then also thinking about how like, you know, this is really pivotal moment. I don't think Asian women have ever been in the spotlight like they have, mm-hmm. they have right now. And it's, and, and it's a really, really big shame that it took six Asian women getting murdered for that to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like even, even last week's news coverage and seeing how these, all these things were handled, that was something that, you know, as a 21, 21- 21 year old I had never seen in my community and so I think this idea of re-envisioning something that's completely new and not operating under you know what is already there is something that um it's something I've been thinking about a lot and something that I, I still need to understand how that applies to me I mean one of the ways that it can apply to you is if we frame this in call and response The call doesn't always have to be welcoming into something wonderful, right? The call can be a wake-up call, right? Women are murdered. That's the call. The response is your generation. Like one of the reasons why 
I want it to be a part of this, not just because I support Share the Mic Minnesota or support the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, is because it's multi generational. Mm -hmm. And so I love the idea of reminding your generation that you are being called. Mm -hmm. And as scary as it is, you can respond. Well, so what was your call? Mm, I love that. So um, let's see. I am 51. And that means I was born the year after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And so I was the youngest of four kids. And I came into a household that you could feel the reverberations of the changing of passive resistance civil rights moving into black power and also questioning the second wave of feminism. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Voting Rights Act was passed four years before I was born. And what that meant is that, um, you know, black women being able to vote in all 50 states was a new thing. Mm -hmm. And this was also the time when Shirley Chisholm ends up being elected to Congress. That's the year before I was born. She's the only black woman in Congress. And so I'm surrounded by this question of what is the future for black women? It was very easy to answer for black men, right? Black men were modeled at the March on Washington, which was actually six years before I was born. But of course, all of that is around me as I come into the world. Mm -hmm. um, only one woman was allowed to speak at the March on Washington. And so they weren't just Black men. They were also um, mostly Southern Baptists. They were all straight because the one queer Black man, Byron Rustin, who did all the structural organizing, wasn't allowed to be at the dais, right? And so there was only a vision for straight Black Protestant men. Mm -hmm. Well, I was raised as a Black Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a woman. One of my sisters is queer. Um, and I was like, I don't see any of myself in that. Yeah. Um, you know, then when you look at the second wave of feminism, that's when um, Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique. And it was about the problem that no, had no name, which was about middle-class white women in suburbia hoping to get white collar jobs. Well, that didn't really speak to me either because my mother stayed at home and she was proud to stay at home. She was the first woman in the family able to stay at home since my family had been enslaved on the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia's plantation in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to draw my own map on what it meant to have a career, to raise children, to be a straight, straight woman who was a queer uh, ally and to have a black feminism that spoke to me. Mm -hmm. And so I just did it. <laughs> you just did it. I so, just did it. <laughs> so, so I'm 21. So when you were 21 and when you were in college and when you were trying to just do it or where you were trying to grapple with that, what were the big questions? Well, were, there were so many avenues, right? Like what? Right. what, what right. The big question was, I was elected student body president and my senior class had 2,500 students in it. I was the first black woman to be a student body president in the Ivy League. I went to the University of Pennsylvania. This would have been 1990 and 1991. So when I was 21, it was that time. Um, the response to me holding that position was that I actually got death threats and the college had to offer me walking security. The only question I had was if I was going to be involved in politics or write and teach about politics. Mm -hmm. And so I've decided that I wanted to write and teach about politics, but also I decided that hopefully life is long and that there always could be a chapter two. Yeah. Right? So yeah. maybe I'll meet you on the hill. I don't know. I would love that. That sounds amazing. That sounds so amazing. I also think that, you know, you're so right about the multi-generational aspect of, of this project is that um, I think also a lot of what sometimes I get stuck in is, you know, the idea that, you know, I'm 21 and what I'm doing now is what I'll do forever. And, you know, maybe my life ends after 30, because honestly, 30 sounds like it's 
sounds Ooh, like that sounds old. I mean, are you gonna put me to sleep because I'm Nana? You gonna tuck me in? <laughs> but I, I, I like so. Like, do you see yourself? So, like, you know, you 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 become this really accomplished figure in academia. Do you see? Um, do you ever regret your decision to go in academia, or like, where do you like like, or is like the decision to maybe go into politics is that like, you know, like how close do you think how do you, how close do you think that that is to you? right now I mean, first of all no regret whatsoever because um even though I, I probably seem like a senior citizen to you i feel like i've just gotten started and um i i feel like there are many ways to be a part of the political process that doesn't even involve running for office i mean i was inspired by political appointments mm -hmm. right i mean i have been inspired by um, women of color who have been tapped by people who hold administrative posts. Mm -hmm. And so instead of wanting to be someone like Kamala Harris as vice president, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would rather be at the table helping to make decisions for someone like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But that's what I say today. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? Yeah, I love that. I really, really love that. <laughs> So, um, you know, if we're going to be multi-generational, what would you tell, and we'll close out on this, okay? Mm -hmm. What would you tell your 10-year-old self? I think that I, um, I think that I grew up with a, a complex or idea in my head due to a lot of factors that, um, that, I would never maybe, I possibly would never be able to help myself. And I think that's something that I have learned and grown over in college um, is that, you know, if I want something, I can have it. I can do it. I can go get it. And, and, um, and, you know, those things were really small. Those things, I mean, I remember the first time I ever applied for something as an extracurricular activity, it was a huge deal for me. Cause I, I never even like realized that like that was something that like was in my grasp. Um, and so I think I tell my 10 year old self that I think that there are a, so many possibilities that are so much more attainable than what you than how you what you think they are I think that I grew up really thinking that like a lot of these things were so so out of my grasp being a staffer or you know working working or interning or doing whatever I I always thought that those were so out of reach it would take like years you know I looked like it would take years and it would take so much um and I, I might not even get there and so I'd, I'd really tell myself that um that like things are a lot closer than they are and things are a lot closer than they are because you're a lot bigger than you are because I think that um that idea of shrinking is something that has that has always been something I've I've, I've like battled with myself so yeah okay so I'm going to revisit with you next year <laughs> to ask you if you have remembered that you are bigger than you think you are yeah okay. yeah We'll have that conversation. We'll have that conversation. Okay. Yeah. So why don't you tell people again um, how to say your name and where to find yourself on social media? Yeah, my name is Amy Zhou. Um, my handle on Instagram is Amy Zhou too. Um, my, uh, oh, I think that's it. I think that's that's the only social media I really want to share. Okay. Okay. So that once again is multi generational because I'm on Instagram, but you can't really find me there because I barely know how to get there. <laughs> my name is Duchess Harris, and this is going to be posted on my LinkedIn page. And given the fact that it's a pretty unusual name, if you type in Duchess Harris, you're going to get me. And I am delighted that I've gotten to meet Amy and I'm appreciative that we were both invited by the Women's Foundation of Minnesota and Share the Mic Minnesota and find us on LinkedIn.